All right. Well, we have a pretty full schedule. Uh, so in the interest of getting started, I think, uh, and finishing on time, I'd like to say a few words to introduce everybody. And then we can uh, allow our presenters to get going. Uh, so I want to thank everybody for coming and joining us for what is our sixth and final webinar uh, within the Crustacean Task Force framework. Uh, if you haven't attended before, I'm Nathan Wilsey. I'm a graduate student within Stony Brook University. Uh, and I'm a working author on several of our Crustacean Task Force manus manuscripts and uh, generally the resident sort of uh, webinar wrangler moderator. Uh, so these webinars have been a pleasure to host and uh, we've sort of addressed a lot of different emerging research and different relevant issues to international crustacean fisheries. Uh, and we do have quite a few talks to get through today. So uh, I wanna give everybody ample time to present. So we'll have each presenter describe their work. And as you're listening, as an attendee, you know, you can feel free to type any questions you might have into the Q&A box sort of as they occur to you. Uh, and then after each presentation concludes, we'll have a limited time for the author to field some questions from the crowd before we have to move on. Uh, <laughs> I also hope our authors might be able to answer any questions that continue to pop up within the Q&A system uh, as we move on through other presentations, so everybody has a chance to get their uh, questions answered. So to start us off, uh, I think we're going to have our two of our principal PIs, Dr. Yang Chen of Stony Brook and Dr. Kristen Kleisner of the Environmental Defense Fund, who will describe some of the goals and, and different research outputs and overall implications of our Crustacean Task Force research group. So let me uh, share their slides here. And uh, whichever of you would like to take it away, just let me know when you want me to move on to the next slide. Thanks, Nathan. I think I'm going to kick us off tonight. I'm Kristen Kleisner. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you this evening or this morning, wherever you are coming to us from. Um, and yes, Yang and I have had the pleasure to lead this group for the past couple of years. Um, with it's a I'll kind of explain who's in the group, um, but the the goal of this task force um, was to try to um, determine some guidance, um, scientific and management guidance, to try to advance um, priorities around crustacean fisheries management. Uh, so uh, it is a collaboration um, supported by Lenfest Ocean Program, and um, I guess you can go to the next slide. Sorry, I have a very loud cat in the room with me, so I apologize for that. Um, this is a picture of some, uh, not even all of the task force um, from our uh, first and only in-person meeting in Hawaii. Um, it was a great meeting. We had um, many of the task force members uh, present. Um, this was this collaboration was a partnership between uh, crustacean experts from Indonesia, the Philippines, uh, China, and the US. And um, the, the uh, project was developed pre-COVID. So the idea here in the very beginning was to actually have um, in-person meetings in each of um, our partner countries. Um, part of the, as I'll describe, um, and Yang will describe, the purpose was a learning exchange between um, experts in these different countries, which was, are the top uh, crustacean producing countries um, in the world. And unfortunately, circumstances in the world didn't allow us to have all of those meetings, but we did have one centrally located meeting in Hawaii. Um, and for those, we had virtual participation. And for those in person, it was, um, you know, a really uh, special time to, to all be together. Uh, next slide, please. So the Crustacean Task Force, um, we have um, Young and myself um, with a lot of support from um, Jeff Young and Ali Cardozo, who's on and who has been helping to um, do a lot of the, the setup and um, facilitation and organization uh, behind all of our, our meetings, um, virtual and in person, and these webinars. Uh, and then uh, we have a couple of advisors, Kim Friedman from FAO, Cody Sawalski, who's on tonight um, from NOAA, Mike Wilberg um, from the University of Maryland Chesapeake Biological Lab, 
Um, we have our task force members from China, from Indonesia, from the Philippines, um, and from the U.S. And um, it's a you know it was a, a pleasure to work with everybody, and everyone brought um, a lot of different perspectives um, to the table, which was the you know one of the key points of doing this work. Um, so next slide. So the overall objectives for the task force, one of the main ones to, was to identify what are the priority needs for improving science and management for crustacean fisheries in each of the countries, and what are best approaches for addressing these needs. And obviously, each country has different uh, contexts, uh, different capacities for um, undertaking um, data collection, for undertaking science, for undertaking management. Uh, and so really trying to figure out uh, what each particular context required um, in terms of um, what is being applied right now and what could be applied in the future. Um, and uh, it was a very collaborative effort. And the uh, one of the goals uh, was to have um, so a support network basically for you know participants uh, supporting each other in advancing science and management of crustacean fisheries um, and um, and trying to identify uh, how you know what what plans would look like in the future including how we we take this work forward so we'll we'll touch on that a little bit um, and another goal was to develop this rapport um, between the participants um, to carry on into the future and serve as advisors and collaborators um, for um, improving crustacean fisheries management beyond just the life of the project. Um, so next slide, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Yang. Yeah, thank you, Kristen. Uh, I just wanna echo Kristen's comment that it, it's, uh, it, it really, I really enjoyed the, you know, this uh, uh, working with all the team members. And I think a lot of, all members actually um, um, brought a lot of the experience and uh, and uh, their expertise uh, to uh, this task force. And, uh, you know, so uh, we have a lot of a discussion. So unfortunately, you know, we would not be able to uh, follow the original plan to have a, a in-person meeting in each country, um, but it, uh, we did it. Uh, go through all, all those uh, uh, online meetings, you know, with a, a big group, a small group, and we form quite a few working groups. And uh, eventually, you know, with all the discussions uh, 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 within the task force, uh, we uh, uh, come up with uh, some uh, uh, five, basically five major uh, uh, projects. And uh, they are listed here. And uh, so uh, uh, those are projects that are led by uh, you know, uh, different uh, uh, team members uh, from different countries. As you can see that uh, uh, the project included, you know, the development of biological reference point uh, to consider the unique characteristics of uh, crustacean uh, fish life history and uh, the fisheries, and, uh, and then identify, uh, test the crustacean fish performance using uh, data-based uh, indicators, uh, considering that uh, uh, a lot of uh, crustacean fisheries are, are assessed uh, uh, with very limited uh, data or, have, or maybe even have no assessment, uh, formal assessment at all. And, I, and, then, and then we also um, uh, form a working group uh, to try to understand uh, the data gaps and limitations in crustacean fisheries management and uh, try to identify opportunities uh, for improvement. And, uh, and then I think, uh, you know, we also think that uh, uh, some crustacean fisheries, although you know, pretty small fraction of uh, overall, but it, we still have uh, some crustacean fisheries have uh, uh, a lot of data available, and uh, so we have a uh, um, uh, we have a project that I try, try to showcase when you have a lot of information, you know, how you can do the stock assessment, and uh, so that I think it showcases the importance of the data, uh, importance of a monitoring program, and. Uh, and, and uh, I think uh, kind of a direct, uh, you know, us to the in the future, you know, if we can collect the more data, uh, we'll be able to do stock uh, formal stock assessment. And that will generate a lot of information uh, that can be informed um, uh, inform fisheries management. And finally, uh, we uh, have a project to uh, try to evaluate an adaptive management framework uh, supplied to crustacean fisheries. So those are five uh, uh, projects uh, that will be uh, introduced uh, uh, in this webinar in more details by uh, uh, by the leader of this project. Uh, next slide. Uh, 
this one. And so uh, 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 finally, you know, as a kind of a final product of the working group, uh, we also plan to develop a high-level uh, thesis paper uh, that will present uh, the work of a crustacean task force and to identify the key information needs, uh, data gap, and refine approaches for better assessment and management of uh, crustacean fisheries. And in this paper, of course, we are uh, a draw from all the parts of the you know, working groups of projects that I described uh, in previous uh, slide. And uh, uh, in, at a very high level, of course, uh, uh, to present a generalizable approach to achieving a better uh, crustacean science assessment and management. Uh, it will also highlight uh, research and the policy priorities for enhancing assessment and uh, action towards uh, better management of crustacean fisheries. And uh, hopefully at the end, I think that we have been talking with uh, uh, our FAO uh, advisor and um, uh, we're gonna produce uh, uh, FAO uh, technical mem uh, memorandum uh, uh, next year. Uh, try to combine all the lessons that we learned, all the materials we combined and uh, com com uh, uh, we compiled and uh, try to um, uh, kind of showcase, you know, best practice guidance for improving crustacean fisheries management in the world. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so so just uh, this slide, just to uh, try to summarize uh, uh, what do we have achieved so far. And, uh, you know, if we showed experience and uh, identified the common needs and the gap in knowledge and across the different countries, you know, four, four uh, major uh, crustacean producer countries. And we advanced uh, uh, to improve the science and research of crustacean stocks and fisheries and identify ways to improve management uh, intervention and apply lesson learned. And we built a wrapper and uh, established a foundation uh, for ongoing and future exchanges and collaborations among uh, task force members. So we probably will not stop here, you know, at the, at, at the end of, the, of this, uh, this project. Uh, I think it will continue uh, ho hopefully we'll continue to work together and uh, to further improve uh, uh, crustacean fisheries stock assessment and management. And we're gonna publish uh, a few uh, peer reviewed uh, papers and uh, we have a, you know, ongoing and the plan and, and, um, and, and uh, uh, we are a few, uh, there are quite a few uh, uh, papers that are uh, almost done or almost, uh, you know, ready for uh, submission. And, it, and it, as I said, we're gonna we're gonna uh, uh, put together FAO tech memo uh, with best practice and guidance for monitoring assessment and management of crustacean fisheries. And it, and uh, and we also want to explore uh, develop as a policy briefs that are geared towards uh, uh, Indonesia and Philippine and, and Chinese fisheries management agencies and uh, to champion better science and, and management practice. And, I, and I, finally, I think we want to, you know, use this kind of opportunity to promote, further promote uh, international collaborations uh, to develop science-based uh, fisheries management, and, I, and uh, which you know create opportunity to provide a, a global leadership and advanced crustacean science uh, research and management approaches, and also demonstrate a high impact model of inter, uh, international collaborations and exchanges. I think this is the last slide, Nathan. Yeah, that's the final one. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you, Yang and Kristen. That was great. Um, so I, I want to remind, I guess, all of our attendees and guests, if you have any questions, um, you can put them in the q and I don't expect there will be too many questions on the basic introduction, but of course, uh, if you have anything, feel free to put it in there and we'll address them whenever we have time. Uh, I think I'd like to get started right in the presentations because we have a pretty full schedule and uh, I will be going first. So fortunately, I don't have to introduce myself again, but uh, I'll be presenting this sort of case study of, of biological reference points within the crustacean task force fisheries program. So let me just share my slides here. All right, if everyone can see that, I'll get going. Um, so this specific project was sort of designed as a review of international crustacean stocks across our member nations 
And we're trying to identify if there were systemic regional differences in management capacity, um, specifically considering the implementation of different biological reference points and harvest control rules as kind of a metric for overall management complexity. So biological reference points are uh, pretty well used in fish, fish, fin fish fisheries. Uh, however, their application to crustaceans has typically been slow. And this is kind of due to a mix of both fishery novelty and some of the complications of managing unique crustacean, crustacean life histories within these frameworks. Um, some example differences uh, in the assessments of crustaceans versus fin fish. Um, you know, there's obvious differences in growth Crustaceans, you have things like molt increment versus sort of a continuous growth for fin fish, uh, different levels of catchability uh, across different fishing years, changes in spatial distribution and across life stages and, and migrations. And these are all sort of important differences that reflect sort of the habitat preferences and some of the different environmental effects on the different life history stages of crustaceans. Uh, for another example, uh, many decapod crustacean fisheries will use traps, which have a very high fishery discard survivability for crustaceans. And this kind of combined with a seasonal molt increment uh, makes management using things like a minimum size much more effective for a trap-based crustacean fishery than for a typical thin fish fishery. Uh, there's also things like protection of buried females be tie into this high survivability. Um, and these unique aspects of the fishery can potentially help alleviate some management pressure and support healthy fisheries in spite of poor reference point integration. So for this project, we specialized in fisheries within the United States and Indonesia to contrast the management differences across the high value decapod crustacean fisheries that occur there. And we asked experts on each species to complete this template we devised uh, to describe the general status of the you know, avail available data, management strategy, uh, reference point, and harvest control rule integration within the fishery. So we've compiled these case studies here, and I'm gonna sort of get into presenting some of the patterns we've been seeing. So for the North American subgroup, we use snow crab, American lobster, dungeon S crab, blue crab, brown shrimp in the Gulf of Mexico, and Northern shrimp in both the Gulf of Maine. And additionally, uh, the Greenland stock is sort of a foil in comparison for the Gulf of Maine stock. And using these six American species as case studies, uh, we can describe over 65% of the total crustacean landings value within the United States. Uh, so I think it's fair to say the general state of crustacean fisheries in the US is, is pretty well described. And with few exceptions, these species are assessed with complex models, uh, mostly size structured models that describe stock status along with uh, semi-annual reviews. Generally data availability is high. Um, there's robust systems of you know, fishery dependent logbook and landings combined with observer coverage and different layered state and federal independent trawl surveys. And the fisheries themselves are pretty well studied with these really long time series of data uh, across pretty highly industrialized fishing fleets. So with these long time series of data and generally high model complexity, uh, unsurprisingly, the, a lot of these species have some identified biological reference points. But the sort of unusual pattern is how few of these reference points are actually meaningfully integrated into management through the fishery management plan. So to give just a, a couple sort of particular examples, uh, for American lobster, which is a very data rich, well studied species, reference points are well identified in the broader scientific literature. Uh, but as far as management goes, they've been largely abandoned in favor of trend based assessments. So although trend-based assessments have worked well to categorize the kind of current boom we're seeing in the Maine lobster fishery, uh, they do have weaknesses, especially when you're assuming kind of homogenous relationships between things like uh, crustacean mortality, growth, recruitment, and how that ties into environmental conditions uh, based on a historical time series when we know we're undergoing a change in climate. Snow crab assessments uh, use FX percent at about F35%. Um, and they use that as a metric to guide harvest control rules, and that constrains fishing mortality, uh, as does American blue crab. And these were basically the only harvest control rules available for any of the crustacean stocks we studied. Gulf of Maine shrimp is kind of a unique perspective since the fishery has been under moratorium since 2012. And although it does continue to go through a continuously updated stock assessment program, there are no reference points developed for this species at all. Uh, 
Greenland northern shrimp, uh, part of why we include it is it's kind of an interesting foil because it's the same species. Um, and they use a very wide variety of reference points with a quota set by MSY under a precautionary limit. And, you know, the fishery moratorium on the Gulf of Maine may kind of discourage further development of these relationships, but it's pretty interesting once we start kind of digging into them. For the Southeast Asian fisheries in, in Indonesia, these are generally more novel than their North American counterparts, or at least they're more novel at an industrial scale. And they often have a reduced time series of data collection and relatively fewer scale, large scale sampling regimes. So within the fishery, there's a greater diversity of gear types and typically more reliance on an artisanal scale harvest. And so our two case study species are kind of also managed across multiple international borders uh, with potential spatial differences in stock composition that's kind of poorly described. So to sort of further complicate management, even uh, spiny lobster in Indonesia is managed as an aggregate, but it's actually a complex of seven different species. Um, and these are managed spatially at, at a zone level within the country. And these fisheries are a hybrid mix of, you know, artisanal, industrial, uh, and also, also aquaculture capture. So they have an extremely limited fishery management, management plan currently in place for spiny lobster. Um, but this is mostly focused on aquaculture capture and any reference points that exist uh, are only for, available for four of the species, scalloped, pronghorn, painted, and long-legged spiny lobster. And none of these reference points have been formally adopted for management. So there are some sort of regulations put in place on the national level for a, a legal size limit and restriction of certain very destructive fishing years, um, but these are pretty basic input controls and we don't really have any formal harvest control rules for any of these species. The swimming crab are extremely widely dispersed um, and represent basically one of the, the highest value fisheries wherever they occur. And so these fisheries are, are sort of split between trap and gillnet uh, across inshore waters. And in Indonesia, blue swimming crab, uh, as well as spiny lobster, are both managed by um, MMAF across the 12 provincial management areas. Um, but blue swimming crab specifically is considered overexploited currently. So across Indonesia, they have several different fishery independent multi species surveys and port sampling regimes to collect biological data. Um, however, catch allocation is generally derived from uh, landings by port exclusively. And they also have for BSC um, some management measures implemented to receive to reach different conservation goals. Um, these are things like a minimum size limit, total allowable catch, restriction of different fishing gears, um, SPRs as a reference point, and some measures to protect both undersized and buried females. Um, and as of 2022, they use a, a surplus production model to describe general abundance. And while strengthening of these different socioeconomic indicators is been identified as a management priority, there's no harvest control rules for the species as well. So after a, a pretty formal literature review, we concluded with uh, these are sort of 10 specific biological reference points, along with some empirical reference points uh, that are routinely applied for fin fish fisheries. And I'm not going to really cover them in depth, but I like to include the table for a general review of their purpose. And they range in complexity and data requirements. Um, and they're not uniformly useful across all cases for fin fish, uh, but many are commonly applied to fin fish fisheries. So when we start looking within our case studies, uh, we find these reference points pretty poorly applied within fishery management plans across the board. Empirical reference points are widely available and used. Um, however, these kind of represent an almost absolute minimum uh, as far as reference point integration. FMSY is the most commonly applied reference point, and that still only has five out of our nine case studies using this metric. Some reference points common to finfish were absent entirely, uh, things like FMAX, B50%, um, things like virgin biomass were basically uniformly uh, ignored across all our species. And while it is exceptionally difficult uh, to calculate things like virgin biomass with crustacean species that are really so closely tied to shifting environmental parameters, um, integration of some of these reference points could really give insight on historically stable population parameters, especially as we're seeing a lot of climate-induced shifts. So to give a, a reference for some of these long versus short time series I'm, I'm talking about, I designed this table to describe the fisheries 
They're ordered from left to right by the relative length of their landings time series, uh, along with a, a current landings in 2020, relatively current, and kind of a five year approximate landings trend. And then we get into the reference points available for the species. So here where we isolate just the reference points available across the case study species, uh, we're seeing a disparity in management is really apparent. Uh, biological reference points are not uniformly applied uh, within the United States or in Indonesia. The color scale of the plot uh, is split. So the gold checks uh, are reference points where they exist in the wider scientific literature, um, but are not effectively or, or meaningfully applied to management. And green ones are where management actively considers the reference point uh, within their fishery management plan. So to, just to draw some kind of quick patterns and not get too lost in things, um, if we compare fisheries like the extremely successful American lobster fishery in the Gulf of Maine uh, with something like this tending overexploited blue swimming crab in Indonesia, uh, we find that the Indonesian management actually incorporates more reference points, although still somewhat limited, uh, than American lobster. And this also points, paints kind of a somewhat incomplete picture if you look at it on its own, since trend-based assessments have been used uh, to describe stock status for American lobster very successfully. Input control-based fisheries may have a worse representation of biological reference points overall, since they don't rely as heavily on quota numbers and instead on these input controls. And although we find most fisheries could benefit from additional reference point integration, uh, the issue is much more critical for these emerging fisheries with poor data availability and short time series. High data availability, data availability and model complexity does not necessarily guarantee adequate use of reference points. Uh, Gulf of Maine shrimp, for example, is extremely well studied, but has no biological reference points developed um, or applied. Although the moratorium on fishing sort of precludes the need uh, for implementation currently. Greenland shrimp, which is managed jointly by ICES and, and NAFO in Europe and Canada, has the greatest variety of reference points implemented, along with a discrete total allowable catch and pretty robust population modeling. And the high value of the Greenland fishery is an important driver for management. However, just as important is the fishery style. So this is more of a trawl fishery with industrial processing, which makes managing by total allowable catch uh, much easier than, than a smaller scale, larger stakeholder fishery. Again, snow crab uh, operates with one of the few uh, harvest control rules we found using FX percent to constrain fishing mortality. Uh, the conservative use of this control rule helps maintain that fishery, um, at least up until recently, uh, <laughs> while cutting down on the number of additional reference points you might need to describe the population. So this is kind of the thing you're going to keep hearing about, I think, through a lot of these uh, talks. but. Basically, since 1990, uh, there's been almost a doubling in crustacean fisheries landings. And overall, global landings have not changed that much across this time frame, which means crustaceans are a, a growing proportion of overall fisheries. And they can be highly meaningful because they have this sort of inflated landings value. So application of reference points to these species is really critical to manage some of these emerging fisheries and, and growing fisheries. However, when you develop these reference points, you kind of need to couch them in the unique biology of the species uh, and the behavior of the fishery. And things can't always be super easily transferred from existing fin fish management. So for species with really long time series and well-established management protocols, uh, BRPs may have less immediate value, um, but they're also the easiest fisheries to apply reference points to. So emerging fisheries with poorly described fishery behavior or a lot of unknowns in the species life history, shorter time series of abundance or landings really have the most uh, value to gain from reference point integration, but also the greatest obstacles to implementation. So while reference points have a great potential for management, um, you really need to consider these obstacles to implementation and kind of mitigating reasons for why these may or may not be applied uh, intuitively along with data availability. So clearly we need a species specific approach uh, for reference points rather than just kind of a broad recommendation across all crustacean fisheries. So with that, I would like to uh, thank all of our experts, some of which are here giving other uh, talks this evening uh, for filling out our, our data templates and our case studies. And uh, if you have any questions or ideas, please do not hesitate to ask a question here or reach out to me at my email below. So thank you for watching.
And uh, I'll, I'll leave a minute if any questions pop up. And if not, I think we can move on to our next speaker. I can also uh, answer any questions in the Q&A and in, in the chat as they come up uh, throughout our other presentations. So I think I'll just keep moving along then. So uh, we'll be going in, in order that they were introduced in our, our introduction. So next we have Claire Ober, who is a graduate student at Stony Brook within Yang Chen's lab as well. Uh, she'll be presenting her work within the Crustacean Task Force, describing the application of performance indicators uh, to the management of some of our case study crustacean fisheries. So take it away, Claire, whenever you're ready. Thanks. So uh, let me just share my screen here. Um, okay. So yes, hi everyone. I'm Claire, uh, and I'm just going to be just going to be giving a short talk and sort of like an update on the Project One uh, folks and what we've been doing. So we were focusing here on the application of performance indicator indicators to the management of international crustacean fisheries. Um, many crustacean stocks globally are not formally assessed, um, or the stocks are data limited, meaning that many of these fisheries. Um, cannot utilize sort of more traditional stock assessment approaches um, and therefore utilize um, a wide range of data limited approaches. Um, but one of the many challenges that a data limited fishery can have uh, is that often they lack sort of the resources that are that they need to be able to kind of create the quantitative data uh, that traditional methods and approaches for stock assessments require. So, uh, for example, many data limited fisheries might not have um, appropriate life history information, uh, or perhaps not have consistent data collection. Um, so part of our job in group one was to look at uh, fishery performance indicators as a possible um, alternative uh, to formal stock assessment models and methodologies. So performance indicators uh, have been utilized before, and they can be a promising tool for being able to inform management because they are a way uh, to integrate social, ecological, biological, um, local governance and community-based data in the, evalu in the evaluation of the fishery. Um, they allow for sort of this broader set of, of information and, in, and criteria in determining the fishery status. Um, and a lot of the sort of information that this process might utilize is very different than what goes into like a more traditional quantitative uh, fishery stock assessment. So performance indicator based management frameworks uh, are a good way to provide a path forward uh, to set sustainability goals for these fisheries. Um, and they're also good across a wide sort of array of data availability. Uh, as I've mentioned, they have been applied to other fisheries, uh, definitely than the other ones, than the ones I will touch on today. Uh, and But they are generally considered to be a cost-effective tool since they don't require detailed data that would be costly to go out and sort of collect. Um, and it's a way that you can sort of look at changes in a stock status uh, and advance the fishery towards sort of their general uh, individualized uh, fisheries goals. Um, as I said, performance indicators have been applied to other crustacean fisheries and, but mostly to finfish fisheries. Uh, and there are a huge amount of individual performance indicators that have both been proposed and applied to these fisheries, depending on sort of what kind of data is available. So even though there are a lot of very specific individual performance indicators, um, there are four larger categories of indicators that sort of shake out. And, there's, and these would fall into the categories of biological ecological indicators, economic indicators, social indicators, uh, and governance-based indicators. Uh, many of the individual indicators that have been developed and applied to other fisheries uh, come from sort of the World Bank and other studies that utilize that methodology. Um, and, you know, these individual performance indicators as well uh, can be found uh, as they're compiled in the fishery performance database. So introducing uh, the case study fisheries for this that we were sort of looking at, 
Um, our case studies, you know, they span uh, fishery scale, crustacean groups, and of course, uh, differing countries. We looked at indicators used in the American lobster fishery, China's gazami crab, Indonesian blue swimming crab, and the Philippine mangrove crabs. Um, and this fishery is actually made up of, of three different species that represent the mangrove crab fishery. Um, these case studies span varying levels of management schemes, uh, performance indicators that are already in use or have been identified, uh, and uh, varying levels of data availability and uh, time scale as well. So this is just a table that we put together that sort of illustrates that point. Um, so looking at, we first looked at the data streams that were available, the survey types for each of the fisheries, what sort of information was being collected. Um, this is a good way to not only illustrate the range of the data that was available our, across our case studies, but also time series of collection um, and their possible concerns for some of, some of our data sources. Um, you know, the United States uh, is considered to be very data rich in the American lobster fishery in particular. Uh, and so uh, there were a lot of data streams and a large time scale available for, there, for this, uh, but not all of our uh, case study fisheries followed suit. And so we thought that it was important to have this uh, column for concern uh, as well. Uh, so starting with American Lobster, we wanted to see what performance indicators uh, were already sort of in use here uh, and what had been developed as well. Um, and the American Lobster fishery, which is considered very data rich, um, does have some types of fishery performance indicators developed and some that are used in current management decisions and play into that sort of trend-based assessment. Um, but uh, there are no current new performance indicators that have been proposed to be used in management. Um, and there are currently no so social or governance-based indicators utilized in the management of this fishery. This is a trend that we found uh, throughout the rest of our case studies, um, with one exception being the Indonesian blue crab fishery uh, that social and governance-based indicators uh, were sort of underutilized uh, and, and underrepresented compared to biological and ecological indicators uh, and economic indicators. Uh, China's gazami crab fishery only uses one performance indicator to support their management, uh, and that would be to utilize total landings for this fishery. Um, there is no social or governance indicators currently sort of in development, um, and there are a few economic ones proposed, but sort of not in development for use in management decision responses. Um, to contrast, uh, very interestingly enough, the Indonesian blue swimming crab fishery has a wide range of performance indicators uh, in a wide range of use stages. So this fishery does already utilize some pre-identified performance indicators, such as SPR, uh, which was mentioned before, which is spawning potential ratio. Um, and that's an indicator of relative change in fishing rates. Um, but then there are other indicators, if you look here, that do exist, such as export standards uh, being one example, but they're not included in management decisions. So there are some that exist that are included in management, some that exist that are not currently. Um, and then there are a whole lot of indicators that are sort of partially developed or that are in the process of being developed for the purpose in the future of being included in management plans and like actually being utilized. So those indicators that are in that stage, those are all uh, sort of in varying stages of being implemented or developed um, within management plans of sort of three to five years, maybe even 10 years out. Um, you know, clearly among all of these case study fisheries, there's a wide range of both performance indicators that are currently utilized and also the types of performance indicators as well. Um, none of our case studies, except for, as you see here, the Indonesian blue swimming crab are looking to include social or governance indicators into their management strategies at the current moment. Um, the Philippines mangrove crab fishery uh, is our last one, and I did not make a slide for it because they currently uh, do not have any uh, performance indicators 
in use uh, or developed yet. But that's kind of great for us um, because our group is working uh, on a white paper or sort of policy brief uh, with the Phil Philippines case study team members and sort of for them recommending not only some performance indicators that could be developed based on what data they have available to them and sort of like what data streams that they are currently collecting that once validated would be very useful for them, um, but also being able to look at you know what could be developed based on other crustacean fisheries with sort of similar data streams or data patterns and availability um, and looking at what performance indicators have been implemented there. Uh, also sort of utilizing these takeaways and trends from here, sort of noticing that biological ecological indicators have been prioritized, um, economic indicators being sort of secondarily uh, prioritized and social and governance based indicators almost um, not at all being being utilized or even considered um, and sort of exploring that trend with with our case study fisheries uh, and looking at the fishery performance database and comparing uh, that with crustacean fisheries that have already had performance indicators applied and sort of explore the utility of the indicators that are in use um, and the possibility of using other metrics for management. So if you have any questions based on that, um, I would love to take them in the Q&A box. I've also included my email here uh, so that if anyone gets struck by brilliance after the webinar, of course, feel free to email myself. Thank you very much, Claire. Uh, that was great. Yeah, I think we'll give it just a minute to see if uh, anybody really had something that was itching to ask. And uh, if not, we can move on. Um, there is, I have a question. Could you explain why landings were considered a biological indicator in one case study, but an economic indicator in another? Um, yeah, and the, the tables were sort of just sort of broader to look at patterns, but um, am I still, yeah, okay. Um, but basically because landings uh, can be split either way, depending on how they're recorded. So either a dollar value um, or by sort of just like tonnage, which would fall under biological indicator. Great, thank you. Um, I saw somebody raise their hand, but uh, I think it might be easier if, if you could type it out uh, into the Q&A so that any other, you know, participants might be able to chime in. And I can keep answering questions as well um, in the chat. Yeah, sure. Claire, if you wouldn't mind keeping an eye on the on the Q&A box. Um, and I suppose if you would unshare your screen, we can move on. Yep. So after that, we have our next talk. We have Harlisa from EDF and Duranta Kembaran from the Indonesian uh, National Research and Innovation Agency, who are two of our authors from the Indonesian team. Uh, they'll be presenting on some of the challenges and opportunities for improving assessments in support of data-limited crustacean fisheries management. Um, so I'm very excited to hear them speak. And whenever you are ready, feel free to get started. Yeah. Thanks, Naran. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so today uh, from project two uh, for the challenge and opportunities for improving assessment of data limited crustacean fisheries. Um, this is a collaborative work that we already uh, did before. And for today, uh, I'm going to present this together with uh, Duranta. So uh, basically the goal of this project, um, we highlighted in three goals. The first one uh, to identify the assessment method for crustacean fisheries and the relative data requirements. And the second one, uh, we identify the data gaps for important crustacean fisheries around the world. And the last one, uh, we want to identify the opportunities to fill these data gaps to improve stock assessment and management at lowest cost and capacity. So um, basically, um, we already hear uh, from some presenter before, the background of this study, um, we already know how big potential of the crustacean fisheries by seeing their uh, growing proportion 
of uh, the global fisheries landing and also we um, see the potential from crustacean fisheries by their natural conditions as fast growing species and it has a high rate of reproduction make these fisheries um, quite resistant to the fishing uh, pressure. So um, that's why uh, we highlighted that crustacean fisheries, uh, it can be a potential alternative to support the protein source from the oceans uh, while the uh, fin fish getting over exploited. So um, besides that, uh, the increasing market demand for crustacean uh, product in all around the world also met these fisheries have a high economic um, value. So uh, these situations provide a great opportunities to improve the welfare of the people who depend on it. Um, so just sharing the information, as we know in several developing countries, such as Indonesia, uh, the crustacean fisheries, especially for blue swimming crab, has a significant multiplier effect and uh, in several layer society and also including uh, women. By increasing the market demand for the fisheries is uh, not accompanied by adequate management in several main crustacean top producer countries. We face the low scientific and technical capacity, limited available data, and naturally these fisheries has its own uniqueness make these fisheries uh, facing some challenge to using the traditional stock assessment uh, framework. So um, poorly understood interaction between environmental change, these fisheries faces several threats. By uh, seeing those conditions, it is need to increase focus for sustainable crustacean fisheries management, which focus to synthesize a source of data to apply for stock assessments and yeah, we're looking for the low cost and adequate capacity. Okay, uh, nearly 70% of crustacean landing globally came from this study uh, case region. But uh, little information exists publicly concerning aspect of uh, stock assessment and management. There's uh, here, uh, we try to combat the dot of this information through tracking management histories of our case study species. Uh, among case study species, we can uh, see here that the Gajami crab from China has the highest volume, uh, more than three four of other species. But uh, the trend in the last five years uh, gradually declined. The second uh, highest volume came from uh, blue swimming crab uh, of Indonesia, where the trend was uh, fluctuate and uh, tend to decline gradually since 2018. Uh, the same pattern also uh, present in the American lobster and uh, blue crab of the USA. Meanwhile, the volume of uh, spiny lobster from Philippines seems stable. Uh, the fishery value in terms of uh, dollar per kilo uh, of crustacean seems largely different among the countries. Uh, for example, for uh, blue swimming craft in the uh, Philippines have a higher price than uh, in Indonesia. However, uh, the price uh, here, we put here, is the average uh, range price for 2020. And we realized that the price is highly variable with season, uh, with year, even the size and the market driven also. Uh, furthermore, uh, landing are presented here as a simple metric of a comparing this value. However, the true impact of the fisheries should be considered as a greater than the sum of landing and kilos price. Next slide, please. Okay, here we present the distribution of uh, some case study species. It is a uh, blue swimming crab and spiny, uh, spiny lobster in Indonesia and American lobster of uh, USA. Blue swimming crab and uh, spiny lobster distributed in all uh, Indonesian fisheries management areas. Uh, with the with highest uh, volume in 2020 is from uh, FMA 712 for the blue swimming crab and FMA 718 for the spiny lobster. Uh, there are seven species of spiny lobster in Indonesia and their dominance were different among FMAs. So for uh, example, uh, Panulis homaros uh, or scallop spiny lobster was dominant in Indonesian coastal area which is uh, Western uh, Sumatra and uh, Southern Java. On the other side, American lobster distributed in eastern coast of the US, 
from Gulf of Maine in the north to the southern New England in the south, and their production seems to decrease farther south, where the highest was in the Gulf of Maine and the lowest in the southern New England. Uh, the sampling site for all case study fishery mostly covered in a cross FMA, but we still dealing with the continuity of the data collection due to the insufficient of the data collection system, uh, low awareness of the importance to collect the data as an input for management, and also a limited budget allocation. Next slide, please. Okay, management of crustacean stock requires insight and advice on uh, stock biomass and population dynamics, which can be described as a biological reference point given by application of modeling methodologies to available data. Here, we present the crustacean assessment methodology by scaling to the different levels of complexity based on the availability of uh, fishery and species data. A model complexity and uh, reliability of the output data points are variable with the data accuracy and availability. These models can be applied in increasing complexity as additional data streams are made available to management. While the trends uh, in stock abundance can be described with a time series of fishery catch data, but additional source of biological data can be used to increase the model complexity and improve the management advice. Next slide. Yeah. In this table, uh, we present some uh, application of stock assessment models that have been used for crustacean fisheries, uh, such as uh, depletion method, which currently used to assess the stock of pinky, uh, spinny, pink spinny lobster in Mauritania. Time series models have been applied to rock and snow crab in Gulf of St. Lawrence, Canada over the last few decades. Uh, biomass dynamic uh, widely applied to lobster species in Australia, New Zealand, Norway, as well as for shrimp crab and lobster in Indonesia. Uh, among stock assessment models for crustacea, uh, we look that a uh, size structure model is uh, the most ideal for data rich crustacean fisheries. Since crustacean are hard to add species and uh, make this model as uh, the de facto goal for improving. Of modeling complexity in crustacean fisheries. Yeah, um, as I mentioned, uh, that the major impediment to assess and manage crustacean stock because of the high costs and capacity required. So, um, on these sections, we try to summarize the data types, uh, source, assessment model, which applied for crustacean fisheries, as well as the cost information that we collected for, from some uh, case studies in four countries from Indonesia, Philippines, USA, and China, and um, only for certain crustacean species. Um, we categorize the cost into three categories. You can see here the red one, uh, the purple one. Uh, the categorized is low, medium, uh, and high. Um, so from the expert judgment, we conclude that um, the landing data source is the low cost, while the poor sampling and fishery dependent or at sea sampling uh, observer, observer at sea, we categorize as medium cost. And for the independent fishery independent survey as the uh, highest cost. In uh, addition, we also try to identify the gap during data collection process, the quality of the data produced, as well as the technical capacity needs. Um, for specific um, process here, process on the red color here, it means that uh, refer to the difficulty of completing the data collection process. While uh, collecting logbook and lending data will be relatively easy, the signing of fishery independent sampling scheme require much more knowledge. The second one for the quality is the quality of the resulting data from a modeling perspective. While the data from landing time series could be collected to high quality level, the relative imprecision of the data makes modeling difficult. And uh, the last one uh, for the capacity refer to the difficulty of crafting a meaningful model from the resulting data. High uncertainty data creates a need for a high level of modeling skill to describe the stock accurately. Um, from those informations, we come up to compare the value of the fishery 
which explain on the section three with the estimations cost for the data collections and stock assessment process that we collect for certain species. Here we, we show for the American lobster and also uh, the blue semi crab. Um, for the American lobster, we found that uh, the proportion of data collection activities budget compared to the value of the fisheries is only uh, 0.71% while for the BSC in Indonesia, the proportion of the data collection activities compared to the value of the fisheries is approximately 0.03% to 0.29% per VMA. While um, there are additional expenses in managing these stocks, the cost of data collections is generally cited as the main obstacle in bringing new data time series online. Here uh, we see even for fisheries with extremely high data cost like American lobster, it is still a very small proportion of the value of the fisheries itself. So uh, back to the data gap that we explained before um, and refer to the section three that mentioned among stock assessment model for crustaceans, size structure model is the most ideal for data rich crustacean fisheries so that we need to focus to address the gap on the port sampling, sampling at sea, and the fishery independent data. Reduce the cost for collecting data, make the data easily to be collected, and uh, bring down the uncertainty are something that needs to continue to look for solutions. And maybe one of them, uh, one of them, uh, one of the solution is utilizing the emerging uh, technologies. On the opportunities for improvement of the data collection by utilizing the emerging technology, we see that the transition from paper-based to electronic reporting to increase the efficiency and quality of the data, which carefully designed for the change of parameter, also will be one of the solutions. And the second one, improving the use of artificial intelligence through camera or onboard video to take a photo to create digital take and report on size, uh, sex, locations, and effort. This uh, system will be cost-effective compared with the port sampling and sampling at sea. Um, the next one, uh, we also encourage to utilize the sun sensor, satellite telemetry system, and remote sensing data to record the oceanography parameters as the monitoring support to uh, correct temperature dependent change in uh, lobster catchability, for example. In addition, this also will be useful to predict the future stock health and fisheries productivity. The last one that we identified here, we encourage to maximize use of acoustic receivers capable of tracking the movement of acoustically take the crustacean fisheries over wide areas. So this is, will be useful to maximize independent survey and inform the manager to understand how the crab move, establish the, the seasonal and uh, manage ground fish, trout fisheries in the region that can, uh, that can catch the uh, crustacean as bycatch. Um, the last one, we come up for the con conclusion for this manuscript. Um, as mentioned before, the stock assessment model for, for crustaceans, uh, we recommended the size structure model are ideal for data-rich crustacean fisheries due to uh, the difficulties attributing age to crustacean species. Um, and the second one, the fisheries data collections and management strategy doesn't seem to track with the fishery value. Data collection costs um, are sometimes high, but uh, they can often be justified by the high, by the high value of crustacean fisheries. And um, the actual proportion, as we mentioned on the section four, the data collection cost is less than 1% from the total value of the fisheries in the most extreme case. We also need to consider the value of the fishery and contrasting management costs rather than cost of management in isolations. 
increasing sampling is not a perfect solution. Funding spent on survey effort and the continuous cost of ongoing data collections need a well-described life history and spacious dynamic to be uh, successfully applied. And uh, for the to address the gaps, we see some novel uh, technologies available uh, to increase the collection efficiency and quality of the data. Um, and also we can reduce the cost for collecting data, reduce the uncertainty by using some emerging technology like uh, electronic reporting, AI camera, sensor, satellite, remote sensing, and acoustic receiver. So um, that's all for our pre presentations and feel free to have a comment and questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Harlisa and, and Duranta. That was great. Um, I saw one question popped up, I think, for, for Claire's talk. Um, but if we'll see if anything pops up in the next minute for you guys. If not, Cody is on deck. All right. Well, I'm sure if anything else pops up, people might just need a minute to sort of sort their own thoughts so we can answer them as they come up. Uh, introduce Cody. Uh, Dr. Cody Sawalski has come to us from the Alaska Fishery Science Center. It's something of an old salt here in our webinar series. So thankfully, he has returned to show us some of the work he's been doing with Li Guan to describe novel size structured modeling uh, for mantis shrimps in the Bohai region of China. So whenever you are ready, Cody, please take it away. All right. Well, I'm happy to be back. The webinars have been fun. Thank you for organizing them. And uh, thank you to Kristen Young, too, for bringing us all together. This has been a lot of fun for me. And I'm sad we didn't get to hang out more, but maybe, maybe more in the future. Um, so the talks up to this point have talked a lot about two things, data limitations and interesting biology. And uh, the goal of um, our project was to look at um, different assessment options for these biologically complex crustaceans when we know that we've got data limitations. And um, the, within that overarching context, we looked at mantis shrimp in the Bohai Sea. Um, the reasoning behind that was that in the future, it is hoped that it will be used for uh, a pilot project implementing total allowable catches in China. Uh, if you're going to implement total allowable catches or quotas or anything that outputs um, control sort of fisheries management, you need an estimate of status. And we've got this big range of methods to estimate status for fisheries from very data limited assessments like length based spawning potential ratios, which is one that we'll look at today, to much more data intensive, like an integrated size structured model, similar to the models that we use um, in Alaska and in the Northeast. So um, I guess I will say one really neat thing about the mantis shrimp fishery is that they do have a survey in the Bohai Sea um, and in a couple of years, they have monthly surveys. Um, these are some example data. And the neat things that you can see in them are some of the echoes of this complex biology. You can see different periods of growth, different periods of recruitment. You can see the fishery taking up the um, standing biomass here. So thinking through these different aspects of the complex biology is a very important step in selecting an assessment. Um, for use in management. So um, given we didn't have all the data that we wanted, we simulated it first. We simulated a fishery that looked a lot like the mantis shrimp fishery in the Bohai Sea. And that starts with a, a population dynamics model that was size structured, working on a monthly time step. We just had a single fishing fleet in here, though there are more in the Bohai Sea. And then we could pull data from this simulated world and apply our different assessment models, LBSPR and the integrated assessment. 
And the whole point of this exercise was try to understand um, how well each of those models can tell us the status of the, this simulated fishery. And this works because we know the true status because we've simulated it. We, it's all um, in the computer. So the first question is how well LBS, LBSBR could estimate the status for um, a species with complex biology. And when I'm specifying the operating models that we've made, there are a lot of decisions that need to be undertaken. Um, and all of those decisions are encapsulated in this figure. I'll walk through it briefly here for you. Um, and the top left is the timing of different important life history processes like recruitment and growth and fishing. Um, for this population, fishing happens in every month and growth only happens in July along with recruitment. Uh, the size transition matrix shows how much an individual grows from one size when it molts. Um, there are size-based processes like the probability of maturing or the probability of molting here at the top, uh, fishery selectivity and survey selectivity, and then weight at size. And there are time-based processes like fishing mortality over time or recruitment over time that you also need to specify. Um, so I began by, or, or we began by uh, comparing two different fisheries, a simple one and a complex one. The simple one has, looks like this, has fishing in every month, only has recruitment and growth in July. Um, from the, this simulated fishery, you can get the information that needs to go into LBSPR, which are size composition data from the fishery. And then I can shuffle some of the parameters and get a more complex fishery. So in, in this one, we've got fishing that only occurs in seven months, growth that occurs in April and July, and then recruitment that comes in in January, May, and September. Um, all of the rest of the, the parameters stayed the same for this exercise. And again, we can produce the information that we need to put into LBSBR to estimate status. The upshot of that is that the, um, this is the, the spawning potential ratio, which is the proportion of uh, spawning uh, spawners in the water at a given um, fishing mortality relative to an unfished state. And these blue um, boxes are the true statuses calculated from the operating model. And the red boxes are the uh, statuses calculated from LBSBR. And on the right are the simple models, on the left are the complex models. Um, so when the model is pretty simple, the operating model is pretty simple, LBSPR does a pretty good job of getting the status. But when you throw additional complexities into the, the operating model, like growth in two months instead of one and recruitment in three months instead of one, um, it turns out that it's harder for LBSPR to, to estimate the status of the fishery. So the next question is, can we use a size structured assessment to estimate the status um, more reliably than LBSPR for these complex situations? Um, I'm not going to go into deep into the details, but the, the size structured assessment model that I made for this exercise was very similar to the one that we use in Alaska for different crab species. Um, the data sources going into it were were the simulated data sources, were the, the catch numbers and the size composition data, the survey numbers and the size composition data, and that was all. Um, the things that it estimates are uh, recruitment, selectivity, fishing mortality, growth, and natural mortality. I was surprised, and you'll see in a second, at how well it was able to estimate um, recruitment, fishing mortality, growth, and natural mortality just with the data that it's got. Um, so these are the, the black dots are simulated survey observations from this, uh, this operating model. And then the blue lines are the fits to those. Similarly down here, the black dots are the catches that came out of the simulated model and the red lines are the fits to that. So what you take from this is that the model is able to fit the data that you pull out of the operating model well. Um, these are the size composition data, the box plots are the um, observed data, and then the red lines are the um, 
fits to those observed simulated data for survey and um, fishery size comps on the bottom. Uh, again, the red lines are the true recruitments, the black lines are the estimated recruitments. It does a pretty good job at hitting the relative magnitudes of these. Down here, are the fishing mortalities, again, uh, estimated in black, true in red, um, does a fairly good job hitting these. This is, a, a, I should say that these are relatively simple. We've got constant recruitment, constant fishing mortality. But the idea was to do this in a relatively simple amount order to see if uh, this model could do its job. And it seems like it is doing an okay job of estimating population processes to this point. And these are just the, the growth transition matrices um, from the true and estimated, which were surprisingly well estimated given the data that were available. Um, so, but the big question is, can this model estimate the status of this simulated fishery better than LBSPR? And it does a better job. It doesn't do perfect. It doesn't overlay this blue box plot of the truth, but it gets closer to it than LPSPR was able to. Um, so I think one of the things you would come away from that asking yourself is, is why does the integrated model do better? And um, it's important to think about what we're comparing um, our current population to uh, with respect to the equilibrium conditions. So we, we think of these reference points and the status as a comparison of what it looks like right now to what it could be if there's no fishing. And those equilibrium size composition data look different when the biology is complex. That's what I'm trying to show over here. So on the left are the equilibrium size compositions for the spawning biomass from the complex model by month. Um, on the left side, and then for the simple model on the right side. And uh, the simple model looks very similar throughout time because there's only one recruitment, there's one growth period, but the complex model is more complicated, surprise, um, over time because there are different periods of growth and there are different periods of recruitment. And I think the, the simple explanation for why the integrated assessment is able to better estimate status is that it tries to model more of those complexities than the data limited uh, techniques do. So there's a lot that can be done next and I'm hoping that we'll be able to uh, maintain contact and keep working on some of these questions but um, some of the things that I'm curious to understand are um, what happens if you think there are two months in which recruitment occurs, but there are actually three months or something of that nature. What, what if you get your timing of your biological processes wrong? Does the integrated model still do a, an acceptable job? Um, there's still some work to do, be done with the model. It's a, it's a generic framework that we can apply to lots of different uh, assessment techniques and um, species but it'd be nice to be able to build out things like multiple fleets and environmental drivers of different processes. Um, I guess I, beyond that, this has been really fun for me. I'll say it again. I said at the beginning, I want to thank all of you guys for um, uh, your involvement and my, involving me, I guess, mostly. And um, I hope to see you all again in the future. And if you need to get a hold of me, that's my email address. Well, terrific. Thank you, Cody. Um, and it has been our pleasure to have you as well. So uh, thank you again. It sounds like there's a lot of uh, interesting potential future stuff to do with that model too. So pretty cool stuff. Uh, I guess while we, we wait to see if anyone has any specific questions for Cody, uh, Adich, you're up next. And uh, we'll give it a minute to see if anything sort of trickles in. Can everyone see my screen okay, or let me check? Uh, yes, but you're not in the presenting slideshow mode, so. Is it like in the presenting mode now? <laughs> uh, yeah, now it's in presenter view, so I think you have to switch it. All right, it's keep happening to me. All right, Say so, okay, thank you. I think I will yeah. start. Okay, my uh, name is Sure. Yeah. 
All right. Well, I was going to just in, introduce you, I guess, <laughs> okay. but uh, do the formal introduction. Um, so we have the the luck of, of being able to close out with uh, Adit Seduwan, um, another of our authors from EDF, who together with Dr. Ming Sun of Stony Brook University has been working on an evaluation of different adaptive management frameworks. Uh, so last but certainly not least, uh, Adit, please go ahead whenever you're ready. All right. Thank you, Nathan. So yeah. Uh, so thank you. Uh, we'll present like our work on evaluating adaptive management frameworks applied to data limited crustacean fisheries. So uh, crustacean fisheries has significant contribution to global uh, fisheries production, food security, and economic uh, in developing countries, especially Asia. And some of the Asian countries considered as a major pro producer of crustacean. However, those producers are, are characterized by limited data, scientific capacity, and limited fisheries management. And adaptive fisheries management framework have been touted as being applicable to data limited fisheries management. Uh, we apply three adaptive fisheries management framework here, a uh, FISA, FISPAT, and also data limited um, toolkit to this uh, three uh, crustacean fisheries, namely China Bohai, uh, China Bohai Cementi Shrimp, and then Indonesia, Java Sea Blue Semi Crab, and also Philippine Blue Semi Crab fisheries. The questions that we want to answer are, are these frameworks applicable to Christian crustacean fisheries? And what are the gaps and caveats of this uh, adaptive fisheries uh, management framework? The method that we applied here that we, we are comparing uh, these three frameworks, mainly for the general utilization, of the scenarios from the objective we mentioned fisheries management considered and also the provision of tools in supporting adaptive uh, management practices. And then we highlight key difference between framework and provide preliminary evaluation on suitability, suitability for uh, crustacean fisheries. And then after that, we applied this framework into three crustacean fisheries, the name, the, namely that I already mentioned before, to understand that what is the current uh, management setting. Uh, in FISA, we evaluating the context of fisheries uh, through the resilience to climate change, fishing and non-fishing threat, and also mm -hmm. the projecting uh, future condition, and also the goal setting. And then like you can see here, there is like mostly 11 steps of the FISA. So we do we did majority uh, on evaluating all of this uh, step into like the three fisheries, uh, crustacean fisheries in three countries. And then uh, for the fish pad, we gathering inputs from expert based on question provided by the tools. And then we narrowing down and then like we will, uh, we uh, trying to uh, evaluate the uh, management, the data collection, and then like the management option recommended by the, by the fish pad. And for the DLM tool, we summarize full list of data sorted by categories. And then asking expert on the present and absence of the data type, and then like apply simulation of pseudo data into the tool into the tool. And this is the result of the comparison of the adaptive fisheries management framework from FISPAT, VC, and also the LM tool. Uh, as we can see here, I don't want to uh, go to the detail, but there is like only the FISPAT and also VC that engage. Uh, with process of uh, collaborative with stakeholder and also consider practical and other forms uh, to be included in this uh, step. And while the DLM, uh, they assessing stock status using quantitative uh, available data. Those three uh, adaptive management framework, um, they do like the adaptive management approach in the first path, they highlight caveat and so of, subjected, of suggested option. And then like for the FISA, they do like re-evaluation of the framework on a regular basis. So like we need to reapply the 11 uh, process in the FISA. While for the DLM tool, they do uh, this tool doing adaptive management approach by forecast management effect through the management strategy evaluation. However, these three frameworks need to be tweaked if we want to use uh, in the crustacean fisheries because like uh, the ident uh, the uniqueness of the crustacean <coughs> life history.
Well, and then the next one, we applied fishes into the three crustacean fisheries. In China, uh, we found out that the climate change may, may have positive impact to the mantis shrimp fisheries there. However, due to like limitation of the data, not all of the fisheries tool that available in Fiji for evaluating climate impact, impact could be applied. Uh, we've also found out in the China, a mandatory stream fisheries that management goals has not yet, has not yet been defined, defined. And then like the data limitation for this fishery also prevented several assessment to be used. Uh, since there are no reference point defined, there are no have uh, harvest control rule, and then like the harvest control measures cons consists of like input and output, uh, especially on the gear section and catch quota. While in the Indonesian Java Sea Blue Swimming Crab fisheries, uh, we we see that this is well established management system with minor data gap. Unfortunately, like the climate change impact is a little bit unknown due to data limitation. Uh, in Indonesia, blue swimming crab, the local um, marine ecosystem and habitat indicator has been also have been evaluated. And based on like the method metrics that provided by uh, Fiche, this is suggested to have like six more additional uh, stock assessment based on like available data. And two performance indicator of fisheries get gathered by uh, by the fishery dependent data was existed, but unfortunately is not yet been implemented through the harvest control rule. And the harvest control management measure for the blue blue swimming crab uh, is consists of like input and output data that mainly uh, maintaining on the strong recruitment of the crab. While on the BSC Philippine BSC fisheries, the management setting is a bit. Uh, similar with the condition in uh, for the for the nation, but the difference is that there is an explicit uh, definition on the biological and also economic management goals, and the data availability that a Philippine crab fisheries has is mainly enable uh, the stock assessment and PI tools to be uh, done in fisheries, and comprehensive harvest controller uh, also available to regulate the fishing airport. The harvest control measure that being applied in uh, Philippine BSC is almost similar with the Indonesian blue swimming crab, except there is like the MPA development there, like in the harvest control uh, measures. And then like this is when we trying to apply the fish pad to these uh, three fisheries. Uh, as you can see here, the data collection recommendation option here, uh, there is, fall into like three categories, we, uh, sorry, two categories, uh, basic understanding of the fisheries and also the biological uh, information. So if you can see here, Indonesian is uh, the, has the highest data collection option with uh, 28 option and only six severe caveats. So like the green one is the recommend recommendation for data collection and while the yellow one is the recommendation with caveat. Some limiting factor for the Indonesia is like low to moderate for the monetary investment and also more, uh, the moderate uh, capacity for research and also institution. And as well as like spatial temporal inconsist inconsistency in data collection. So this is like uh, the uh, some of the highlight for this data collection recommendation option. In term of like assessment recommendation option, uh, China is the has the highest one but overall most caveat free option fell into the category of abundance indicator here in, in, in the green one expert judgment multiple indicators and risk analysis vulnerability some limitation for like the china is like the high dynamic, high dynamic life history and moderate research and institutional capacity this is like the limiting factor that limit the assessment recommendation by that being uh, advised by the fish pet. For the management measures, uh, when we applying this fish pet, again, uh, all management option were recommended for the three case study, despite the caveat concentrated in the catch limit here and also the effort limit. Uh, for Indonesia, 
blue swimming crab and also uh, Philippine blue swimming crab fisheries, they are shared identical limiting factors, including low to moderate enforcement capability and absence of the vessel registry C and also fishing effort creep. Uh, this is the result when we applying the LM tool to the those three uh, China uh, sorry those three crustacean fisheries. So the LM tool is a tool for supporting adaptive management as it helps to evaluate candidate management procedures based on available data and different uh, management procedures were recommended by the by the LM for the three case study. So like you can see here, and Indonesian. Uh, Java Sea Blue Seaming Crab Fisheries has the highest data collection, op data collection option with least severe caveat here. Oh, sorry, like 48. And this is because of like better availability of catch and survey data and stock status estimation and uh, abundant estimate of the availability. Some of discussion, some of discussion. So we found out that uh, lack of informative data that enable model stock assessment is one of the challenge that we found in these three crustacean fisheries. And some partially can be resolved by consulting data limited management. And FISA process uh, for interpreting this result may uh, be useful to increase confidence uh, in stock estimation. And the other challenge that we found in these three crustacean fisheries is that like inadequate research, institutional, and also enforcement capability. This, uh, at some point, uh, we, we see that uh, can be solved by engaging like stakeholder engagement through the FISA and uh, FISA and also FISPAT that could foster compliance and self-regulation. Some of the merit and shortcoming of this, the framework for the FISA, it's conceptualize the management goals and object, objective. This is like one of the uh, advantage or like the strength of the FISA. And it's also outlined biological, ecology, and economic sociocultural dimension, and then also consider threat off within this objective. However, we found out that while we doing, uh, where we applying this visa, it's hard to classify governance capacity and system. And that's for uh, visa is so need to be supplemented by the fisheries policy governance uh, that uh, available. And at some point, it's also hard to address inconsistency timeframes for different management measures with different life history and stock productivity. And some of uh, this, for instance, you can uh, hear because of um, the crustacean has a, 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 is a fast growing, uh, fast growing species. So a fast growing species, so it's kind of hard because like we say, it, uh, it changed, uh, it has a short and then like medium and also long-term goals. Mm -hmm. And also in we say, we found that some step require strong recorder engagement. At some point it, it will have a cost. It will uh, has impact on the high cost to convince stakeholder. However, this investment, is expected to get consensus and buy-in from, uh, from the stakeholder. In FISPAT, some of the limitation, it's, uh, it's limitation is like, it's kind of hard to do, to to uh, to capture and do diverse and complex scenario that happen in the real life. For instance, like uh, in, in real life, the various catch handling of uh, in crustacean fisheries Sometimes it involves like the small and uh, industrial, but in the fish pet, they only allow like single option for this uh, situation. And some rec recruitment uh, questions related uh, is applicable for fin fish. And in addition, another thing is like perhaps fish pet could uh, provide like more flexibility or answers beyond mutually exclusive so that it so it will not result any ambiguous input and also unnecessary caveat. While the DLM tool, the strength is like completely built on quantitative analysis. However, it requires high, high expertise in fisheries and also for coding since the LM tool was worked uh, in the R programming code. So uh, we trying to combine these three frameworks uh, stepwise. Um, 
so you can see here's the blue one we we try to combine from the uh fisa and then like the red one is like we trying to to we we we, we get it from the fish pad process and then like the yellow or the gold one from the dlm tool so we trying to put this combination into like the stepwise for process, stepwise process as we have in fisa and divide it into four sections uh, for the different tasks. This is like the one of the strength from the fish pad. Uh, and also like this proposed framework also feature a hybrid qualitative and also quantitative of selection database analysis from the three uh, frameworks, which is particularly useful for uh, data limited fisheries. So like for this, for instance, the goal setting, Section focused primarily on defining management goals, biological, social, economic perspective. And then the second one, ecosystem and environment, perhaps it's not mandatory, but can be applied depending on the specific goal on the fisheries. And then the third section, uh, the fishery stock assessment, assessment, start by analysis of data gaps uh, with the, the, the LM. And then after that one, a suitable uh, performance indicator and first point are selected from preliminary uh, initial assessment, and then determine the type of, of assessment based on the toolbox offered by the FISA and FISPAD. And then the management action is the last action where assessment results are translated into management action. This is done by first specifying management measures, output input control, that corresponding to performance indicator, as well as assessment output. And then uh, the management procedure and have control rules can be developed accordingly using the LM tool followed by an interpretation of their performance and uh, effectiveness. So like by providing this uh, combination, it provides a starting point for developing a comprehensive tools. And one of the implications for the crustacean fisheries is that application for this one uh, reveal that high quality, uh, lack of high quality data and institutional capacity in research and management and also managing component in the, the three uh, fisheries. And for the framework, it is needed to improve uh, in some tweak because of like uniqueness of crustacean life history also population population dynamic. And one other thing, FISA and FISPAD can be used to develop adaptive emerging system with goals, performance indicator, and also first control role that appropriate for crustacean fisheries. And the LM tool may presenting like informed suite of option for managers to improve the performance of their fisheries. And one, the thing that need to be uh, considered by the fisheries manager, crustacean fisheries manager is like, we need to consider like the trade off between socioeconomic demand of local fishing communities and ecological, ecological conservation objective in order to achieve a long term sustainability and resilience, such as climate change. And I think that's all from us. And um, I would like to acknowledge thank you for the Crustacean Task Force uh, group member and also Landfest for funding for this project. And that's all. Thank you. It's terrific. Thank you, Adit. Um, pretty interesting to see you using some of those those frameworks and uh, your results. So thank you for sharing. Uh, I saw Cody answered somebody's question in the Q&A. Uh, if anybody has any questions for Adit, uh, please let us know. We'll be, uh, I guess I can make my sort of formal closing statement while we wait to see if anything trickles in. But uh, I want to sincerely thank all of our presenters both today and at our previous webinars for all of their hard work and their willingness to show us some of their innovative research. So furthermore, I wanna thank Dr. Chen and Dr. Kleisner for their invaluable help guiding this program and sort of bringing this all together. And while this does conclude our crustacean task force webinar series, the show goes on for crustaceans, crustacean fisheries and crustacean fishery research. And our research outputs will continue to be released across the coming months. So this webinar has been recorded and will be available on LenFest's YouTube page within a few days. So please feel free to share this with anyone uh, who might be interested, who wasn't able to join us this evening, or if you attended today and have missed any of our previous, previous webinars, they are available on the LenFest YouTube page as well. Uh, are there any final closing questions or if anyone else would like to make any final closing remarks? Thank you, Nathan, for all your work hosting these webinars. <laughs> Excellent Thank job. Thank you, Nathan. Yeah. Thanks You're to very the whole... kind. It was truly my pleasure. Thanks to all the speakers. Um,
Yeah, and as usual, if you have any questions um, for any of our speakers, they've all made their, their contact information available as well. So uh, thank you all for attending. Um, and I hope you all enjoy the winter holidays and have a happy new year. And crustacean research achieves new, new heights and new peaks in 2023. Oh, Nathan, there was one question about publications with the attendees. Oh, certainly. Share them with the full list. Lundfest will make them. Ha we'll have the list of everyone who joined. Yeah, so uh, keep an eye on your inbox for those as they, as they get published. All right. Terrific. Good evening and, and good morning for all of you as you uh, go off and enjoy the rest of your day or end it. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye